The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are simply that, opinions. All are presumed innocent until proven otherwise in a court of law. Sensitive topics are discussed. Discretion is advised. On this week's Court TV podcast, Court TV anchor Ted Rollins joins me to break down the closing arguments in the Kyle Rittenhouse murder trial. And then we'll move to the killing of Ahmad Arbery murder trial, where defense attorney Kevin Goff made a wild motion to ban famous African-American icons from the gallery. What's behind his motion and how did the court handle it? This is the Court TV podcast with Vinnie Politan. Welcome to the Court TV Podcast. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for listening and downloading. And this episode, we are recording as we are waiting for a verdict in one of the big trials that we are covering. And the other big trial is beginning to wrap up. So the the one where we're waiting for the jury to come back is the case against Kyle Rittenhouse, 17-year-old who was in the middle of the riots in Kenosha, Wisconsin, ended up shooting three people, killing two of them, and we're waiting to hear what the jury has to say. So that's where we are at the time we are recording this. And I, and, and I want to talk about that case with uh, Court TV anchor Ted Rollins, who joins us, who is actually in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Hey, Ted. Hey, Vinny. Yeah, it's uh, pins and needles out here. We're just outside the um, courthouse waiting for word. This jury uh, has had the uh, case now for several hours and um, waiting for anything. We did hear a request from the panel asking for jury instructions, extra copies of the jury instructions, and specifically pages one through six, which has to do with self-defense. And I think that's just absolutely appropriate because that's what this case comes down to. Absolutely. There's, There's no doubt. Kyle Rittenhouse shot these folks um, he had the gun. All of that is not disputed. The question is, was he defending himself or was he a killer, a murderer, uh, according to the prosecutor? So those are the, the, the choices that the jury has. The instructions, um, you know, for and Ted, when I think about self-defense, and yes, there are specific legal instructions and, and it's very well crafted, the instructions and the law, et cetera. But from my perspective, through the years of covering cases where you're talking about self-defense, I think it's a, it's a, it's a step back, bigger picture kind of deal where you look at a situation and you try to figure out who caused the situation, who is the aggressor. And I think that is one of the first things that a jury looks for. And if if it's not crystal clear uh, that the one who got shot started everything, then I think self-defense becomes almost impossible, almost impossible uh, to prove. But uh, looking at this situation, that's what the issue is about, right? It's about who who started all of this. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what the prosecution wants this jury to focus on, so to focus on Kyle Rittenhouse bringing the gun to a bar fight and Kyle Rittenhouse being the instigator, even though the video might show otherwise in terms of Kyle Rittenhouse running away from the event, the people that he eventually shot. The prosecutor wants to turn it and say, listen, you can't start a fight and then say, oh, self-defense. It's going to be a fascinating verdict. You know, you've said this before. This is one of those cases you can watch, see all of the evidence and two different people have two vastly different opinions. Absolutely. Let's take a listen to the prosecutor in his closing argument talking about what you just mentioned, Ted. But what you don't do is you don't bring a gun to a fist fight. What the defendant wants you to believe is that because he's the one who brought the gun, he gets to kill. So I want you to contrast this, two different scenarios. One scenario where there's two guys who are throwing punches at one another like a bar fight. I think we'd all agree, you can't kill someone. You can't punch the guy, knock him to the ground, and then get on him and strangle the life out of him. That's murder. So what's the difference here? The only difference is the defendant brought a gun. He brought his AR-15. That's why he's got to come up with this cockamamie theory that Joseph Rosenbaum was not only going to take the gun, but take it and then turn it on the defendant. And the defendant actually told you 
that he thought Joseph Rosenbaum was going to take that gun and not only kill him, but kill other people, which is really ironic considering the defendant is the one who killed people in this case and the only one. But putting that aside, they have to convince you that Joseph Rosenbaum was going to take that gun and use it on the defendant because they know you can't claim self-defense against an unarmed man like this. Okay, I've got a bunch of problems with what the prosecutor just said, Ted. And, and it starts with his premise that you don't bring a gun to a fist fight. This, I watched the video. This wasn't a fist fight. This was one person chasing another. This wasn't a standoff. This wasn't two people looking at each other, having a disagreement, and then deciding to fight. And the guy with the gun says, well, I'm going to use my gun. You use your fist. I saw... One man chasing another. Then I saw three people going after another. I didn't see a fist fight here. I don't understand this analogy, Ted. Yeah, and it, well, that's what the prosecution needs to get in people's mind if, to win this case. But you're right; it is. It's a bit of a stretch. I mean, you do bring. It's not. It's not even a stretch. It's not true. Well, the idea is that Kyle Rittenhouse, with his gun, and the fact that he pointed his gun at the Z Zeminskis violated Wisconsin law in that now he has committed a crime and you can't now turn it around. You've created the chaos. And this is the prosecution's argument. And now you legally can't claim self-defense because of it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not buying it. And, and you're referencing the, the point where he says in this video, which I cannot see, I do not see it. Some people claim they can see it. Um, that Rittenhouse lifts his gun to the Zeminskis, one of whom is armed, neither of whom is Joseph Rosenbaum. And if, in fact, prosecutors believed that he committed an assault, and this was the basis of their case, Ted, they're relying on evidence that they didn't have until the middle of the trial. They brought these charges, Ted, against uh, Kyle Rittenhouse before they had this piece of evidence that seems to be the crucial piece of evidence for their case. And I, I don't understand that. To me, that is, uh, I don't, it's, it's a prosecutor gone rogue. If in fact, the most important piece of evidence, the, the, the provocation by Kyle Rittenhouse existed in a piece of evidence that no one knew about, did not, was not in the hands of the prosecution or the defense until the middle of this trial. That comes to the theory where many people, and I'm standing outside of the courthouse now watching both sides um, of the argument go at it face to face, yelling at each other. Um, that's one of the theories that people has. This was a, let's charge them and um, we'll, we'll see what we can do in terms of building a case as we get there. And to your point, well, they kept building until uh, midway through and then finally found an aha, ooh, here's a good strategy. Um, and you know, to be fair, every case has continued to be investigated until it's over. So, uh, but you're right. The idea that this now becomes the focal point of their argument saying, no, this is not self-defense. And the fact they didn't know about it until now does raise eyebrows. Yeah. And I'm not even mentioning the fact that his case changed since his opening statement. I mean, his opening statement was was absurd because what we saw in the videos did not match up with his opening statement and his closing argument didn't match up with his opening statement, which I have a problem with as a prosecutor. Your job is the truth, justice. I don't understand how how you're, you're changing your game in the middle of it. Um, it. It's unreal. Let's take a listen to more of, of his closing argument here. You are here to decide whether or not his actions are legally justified not to buy pathetic excuses that might be given to you. As a teacher, when a student says to you, the dog ate my homework, that's an excuse. It doesn't get you out of the homework assignment. If you panic in a situation that is not reasonable, that is an excuse. It is not a legal justification. If you're 17, if you don't have training or experience, if you put yourself in a situation where you're in over your head, if you're scared, those are excuses. Those are not legal justifications to kill. They do not erase your personal responsibility for your own actions. Not 100% accurate, once again. Uh, if you're scared, I mean, if you, if you fear, if you fear for your life or serious bodily harm, that's when, that's when you can invoke, if it's imminent, that's when you can evoke self-defense. 
So being scared actually is part of the equation here. I again, he's playing loose and 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 fast with with some of the facts and some of the law in here. I've never seen anything like this from a prosecutor. And the only way I can explain it is uh, the only time I, I I really see prosecutors going going a little bit rogue is when there's an element of politics involved in a case. And, and, and I unfortunately am beginning to think that is what's going on here, Ted, is that the politics of the case has overtaken the uh, prosecution and their ethical duty and oath uh, to seek justice, which is the truth. And, you know, your case is your case. The witnesses see what they see. And then it's got to be enough for you to prove your case. But I, I, don't under, I don't understand this, Ted. The pressure to file charges against Cal Rittenhouse from day one, minute one, was immense. So to believe that politics isn't a part of this prosecution on some level is um, would be extraordinary if it wasn't. I mean, that, that's just how everybody involved in this. They're all human beings, the prosecutors, the, the state officials. There was immense pressure to go forward. And no matter what, they were going to get to this point, I believe, in their mind, because they wanted to placate was uh, that was a, a very angry um, segment of the public, right or wrong. Uh, I know you would say it's absolutely wrong, uh, but it's reality. And, and I think that is an absolute part of the equation in this case. Yeah, but I'm a former prosecutor. I, I know what the job is. And yes, it's a political um office to be district attorney. And it's a political process, whether you're appointed by a governor, like in the state where I practice, New Jersey, or you win an election. That is part of the politics. But once you are in office, the canon of ethics is is your guide. That's how you have to practice law. And, and that's why this is extremely shocking to me what I'm seeing in the courtroom. And, and, and what I'm saying doesn't necessarily mean that Kyle Rittenhouse is not guilty. I'm talking about the way the case is being tried and the arguments that are being made and, and the process through which this prosecutor is doing all of this. And, and to me, it's, it's beyond. It's, it's beyond what uh, a prosecutor should be permitted to do. And, you know, there was a point in the trial, Ted, where he was commenting on the defendant's pretrial silence, which is, I mean, you learn that in day one and day two of prosecutor school. So I take that and I add it with everything else that I'm seeing here. And, and I'm really not happy with it one bit. Um, and, and I'm wondering, you know, I don't know who these jurors are. You've eyeballed them more than I have. Um, to me, the prosecutor is coming off as someone who believes Kyle Rittenhouse is guilty because he was walking around the streets with an AR-15. End of story. And anything that happens after that is his fault. That's that's the that's that's the theme that I'm getting from him. And uh, unfortunately for the prosecutor, the charge of carrying the weapon has been dismissed. So he can't argue, could not argue that he was violating the law when he was carrying the AR-15. And to, to me, that's the way he's coming across. But I don't know about these jurors, uh, you know, and, and the, the folks in Kenosha. Is Kenosha um, a strong hunting, gun-owning community? Absolutely. Um, the state of Wisconsin is. Now, you talk to hunters, you talk to gun owners, the AR-15, the other assault rifles, that's a different category. You have to be, a, you're, you're at a different level, but the odds of members of this jury who would appreciate the ownership of a weapon of that nature, um, yeah, this is going to be uh, absolutely possible that there are members of the jury that think that way. But I also think that Binger, is possibly tapping into a group and their thought process the other way that indeed there are people that think that Kyle Rittenhouse just by the fact he was traipsing around as a 17 year old with this gun um, strapped on his chest that he needs to pay for these murders and it is it's ignoring the the law the community the, the state of Wisconsin allowed Kyle Rittenhouse to a, along with a bunch of other people that night walk around the streets with assault rifles, protecting property. And um, that is a different conversation. That's not what's being decided here. But that's a, and again, Ted, it gets back to another argument this prosecutor was making. He kept making the analogy that you can't use deadly force to protect property. 
But that's not what this case is about. No, he used deadly force to protect himself in his mind. And uh, yeah. right, right. But, but there's not even an allegation that someone that, that someone was trying to burn down a building and he shot them. The, the facts do, that has nothing to do with the facts here. That there's nothing to do with the facts, and he's making these analogies that are that are not part of the case, and 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 he's making arguments that were based upon the initial reporting of this story, which was that some white supremacist militia member went out and was just gunning down uh, Black Lives uh, Matter members, and that that was the story, right? And then we get into the facts during the trial, and you see that that's that's not the case, that's not what it was, but that's still the case that he's trying. I mean, he was the. He wasn't protecting property. There, it's, it, there's, there's not one piece of evidence that indicates that, but that's the argument he made during his closing uh, to the jury. Right. I, I think it, it, this is the behavior you do see more often on the other side of the courtroom from the defense trying to grasp at straws, get jurors to think a certain way about potential this and that. We're seeing it from the prosecution, and, and I think we all know why. The, the case is a tough one from their perspective, and they're using everything in their power. But ha- did it go over the line? Well, Judge Schrader sure thought it was pretty close with those the, the examples, the, the one that you already mentioned, um, and then the other one when Binger, after bringing up the right to remain silent uh, a roundabout way and getting disciplined, he does it again within minutes trying to bring in evidence that had been ruled on by the judge that was it was not coming in he went down that road anyway so yeah i agree with you uh it it's behavior that we do not normally see from the government and and you don't see it for a reason the the reason we don't see it is because it's not permitted it's not your job i say this all the time on the podcast but it's I pe- it's such an important part of our, our criminal system of justice is that we see that from defense attorneys because they have no obligation to the truth. That is not their ethical obligation. Their ethical obligation is to their client. The ethical obligation of a prosecutor is not to win the case at all costs. I mean, that's why you have things like rules where if, if the prosecutor has a piece of evidence that is exculpatory, that somehow could be used by the defense to argue uh, that he or she is not guilty, that piece of evidence has to be given to the defense. Has to be. You, you can't hide it. You can't uh, pretend you don't have it. You have to give it to them. You have to provide it to them because your obligation is to the truth. Whereas if the defense has a piece of evidence that points to the guilt of the defendant, they have zero obligation to give it to prosecutors. And, and that's when, when, when those roles get reversed uh, during the course of a case, our system of justice is turned upside down. And that's when we have problems and that's when we have lack of trust. And, and that's when people aren't doing their jobs. And, you know, I, I, the more I, the more I got into it in the beginning, I was kind of giving him the benefit of the doubt. Okay. He knows the evidence better than I do. Then the evidence comes out and he's still making these arguments. doesn't make sense to me. I mean, the criticism I have of this prosecutor, I usually, as you, as you pointed out, Ted, it's usually what I'm saying about the defense attorneys. Yeah. You know me, Ted. Yeah, I do. I know you well. And you, you're quick to point out, oh, come on, look at what he's trying to do. Um, and yeah, now we're seeing it on this side. And uh, it, it is concerning the, the, the pressure that is on all of the parties here is absolutely real. Um, and I think we're just seeing human beings react to that pressure uh, pressure on some level. All right, let's listen to a little bit of the defense attorney, Mark Richards, who is very different than the prosecutor. Their their difference could not be could not be greater. The way they look, the way they sound, the way they dress, um, the words that they choose to use. Let's take a listen. My client, when this happened, was 17 years old. His actions are to be judged as a 17 year old, not by Mr. Bigger's standards, but by that of a 17 year old. And Mr. McGinnis said he didn't appreciate the way people looked at him. And maybe he didn't. And I think the best evidence of that is when Mr. Rosenbaum begins chasing him, you hear on the tape, he yells friendly, 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 three times. He thinks that if he just says the magic words, they'll stop. They don't. They could have, Mr. Mom could have looked at it and said, hey, you're not trying to harm anybody. 
I'll leave you alone. Is that what happened? No. He said, you ain't going to do mother and began to continue to chase him. Mr. Rosenbaum made a fatal mistake. Ted, could you describe for the folks the difference between Thomas Binger and Mark Richards, the prosecutor and the defense attorney? Um, Because to me, it is such a contrast uh, on television watching it in in, inside the courtroom. It's got to be even greater. Yeah. I mean, you have a... um... (laughs) Again, a little bit of a role of reversal sometimes in courtrooms. Uh, Richards is the uh, classic old school, say it how it is kind of guy, gruff, um, abrasive at times. Um, I thought in his clothes, he had a couple moments that were a little bit over the top, um, where you have this prosecutor who is... um, I, you know, I want to be careful the way I say it, but um, is is one of those people that you could just imagine that maybe not every juror is going to be in love with. Um, and it is it's a it's a strange contrast. And I think it at the bottom, the bottom line is it, it helps the defense and it helps Kyle Rittenhouse's chances. Just the way the feeling courtroom throughout this trial. And you can blame it on Judge Schrader if you want. I don't I, I think it it's pretty much self-inflicted. Some of the. Um, repercussions that the state has received in this case. No, I I agree with you. You know, we know it's interesting to me, uh, the the one thing that I think really points out the difference between the prosecutor and the defense attorney is one has a pocket square and the other one's got a bunch of pens in his pocket. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) The, uh, yeah. The used car salesman has a pocket square (laughs) and, uh, the yeah, it's unreal. It's a different. It's a, and I, and to be honest with you, looking at these jurors, uh, this is a group that I think is going to gravitate more towards the guy uh, with his pens and and who is more matter of fact. In fact, I, I was mentioning earlier on Court TV that you look at this panel and there are a couple people that old Kevin Goff down in Georgia was talking about, we've got a Joe six pack and, and uh, on this jury. <laughs> and I think <laughs> that that helps the defense clearly. Okay. I want to play just another sample because there's a phrase that Mark Richards, the gruff one uh, uses during his closing argument that I was like, that is, that, that is exactly that. That is the exact uh, quote that should come out of, out of his mouth because it tells me everything about who he is, where he comes from. Take a listen. Kyle Rittenhouse shot Mr. Rosenbaum because he was attacking Kyle. Every person who was shot was attacking Kyle. One with a skateboard, one with his hands, one with his feet, one with a gun. Hands and feet can cause great bodily harm. I'm sure the state's gonna get up and say, well, he didn't have great bodily harm, so it doesn't matter. That's not the standard. The standard is could cause great bodily harm. My client does not have to take a beating from the hands of this mob or the hands of Mr. Rosenbaum. And Mr. Rosenbaum might be little, but he was a pretty muscular guy. And some 30 some year old guy can take a 17 year old kid nine times till Tuesday. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a tough choice, but the evidence only leads to one conclusion. That is that Kyle Rittenhouse's conduct on August 25th was privileged based upon the actions of Mr. Rosenbaum and others. There are no winners in this case, but putting Kyle Rittenhouse down for something he was privileged to do will serve no legitimate purpose. I ask you to do this, do justice here under the law of the state of Wisconsin. Thank you very much. All right, Ted Rollins. I think the I think at the point that he said uh, uh, nine times till Tuesday, the court TV signal switched back to black and white. <laughs> yes, but it, it connected, I'm sure, with a few of the jurors. It was a classic. I I, I love that because it, you know I I grew up hearing those, watching the old repeats of the old tough guy shows, um, and 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 that's who he, he strikes me as kind of a tough guy, Mark Richards, and the process prosecutor is anything but a tough guy. Um, it, 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 and, and the other thing was when they were handling the gun inside the courtroom, uh, they both handled the gun 
And I don't know, it seems like Mark Richards was a lot more comfortable grabbing that AR-15 than the prosecutor. Yeah, but again, you've got the, you know, look at the country, Vinny. There are half of this, maybe half, 40% of this country is appalled by the idea of an AR-15 even being legal for anybody at any time, or maybe maybe less than that, but there's a percentage. and, uh, And there's a percentage on the other side that doesn't understand that. And I think this jury like any group of people that you're going to assemble, you're going to have people on both sides. And the key here is who's leading this jury discussion. And um, the other X factor, which we haven't talked about, but I think is absolutely important is Kyle Rittenhouse's age. He is, he was 17 at the time. He's only 18. Now it's tough for jurors to send kids away. It just is. It's part of our human nature. And there are several women on this jury I think that's a factor as well that needs uh, to be considered. And it's a, it's a, another factor that works in Rittenhouse's favor. And and you talk about that. That was such a big part of the story. Um, you know, the outrage from people. He's 17 years old with an AR-15, and they were using that as an aggravating factor in the way they described it. When But when you get inside of a courtroom and you actually see the person and you're in, in that courtroom with them for, you know, two, three weeks, it becomes... Uh, I think you're correct. Uh, more of a mitigating factor, advantage defense, especially when your first victim is a 30 year old man um, who who is attacking the the 17 year old, despite the fact that the 17 year old is the one that has the the weapon. Not an easy case uh, for the jury. I don't think it's an easy case for prosecutors to try at all. I think it was a very difficult case for them. But I, I'm just upset that some corners were cut and some. Ethical obligations that I believe prosecutors have were shortchanged, and I don't like that. Like, you you have to be willing to lose cases if you're a prosecutor, because you can't do things that the other side is permitted to do. You just can't in order to attempt to win the case. And um, I think it, it, it it's problematic for me. You can see how much I'm struggling with it, um, because at the end of the day, um, I want the jury just to speak the truth and tell us what happened, what it means. Um, but everyone's got to play by the rules and, and the rules are different for prosecutors. Uh, we'll see what the jury has to say about this. But Ted's going to stay with us because when we come back, um, two big trials on court TV, the second taking place in Brunswick, Georgia. And that case starting to wind down a little bit. Um, but there have been some fireworks that are unrelated to any of the evidence in the case and it has created outrage and this is a case that began with outrage uh, because of the video of Ahmad Arbery being uh, chased uh, by three men in two pickup trucks then shot but now what's happening in the courtroom also creating more outrage we'll talk about that when we return For more Court TV, watch it on cable, over the air, Roku, or go to CourtTV.com and stream live gavel-to-gavel coverage. Catch up on the big moments from our current cases and relive some of Court TV's most historic trials. Court TV, your front row seat to justice. It's one thing for the family to be present. It's another thing to ask for the lawyers to be present. But if we're going to start a precedent starting yesterday, we're going to bring high profile members of the African-American community into the courtroom to sit with the family during the trial in the presence of the jury. I believe that's intimidating and it's an attempt to pressure, could be consciously or unconsciously, an attempt to, to pressure or influence the jury. To my knowledge, Reverend Al Sharpton has no church in Glen County, never has, hasn't been here since Elaine Brown ran for mayor, to my knowledge. But we have all kinds of people. We have school board members. We have county commissioners. We have all kinds of pastors in this town, over 100. Uh, And uh, the idea that we're going to be serially bringing these people in to sit with the victim's family one after another, obviously, there's only so many pastors they can have. And if their pastor's Al Sharpton right now, that's fine. But then that's it. We don't want any more black pastors coming in here or other Jesse Jackson, whoever was in was in here earlier this week, sitting with the victim's family, trying to influence a jury in this case. And I'm not saying the state is even aware that Mr. Sharpton was in the courtroom. I certainly wasn't aware of it till last night. But I think the court can understand my concern uh, about bringing people in who really don't have any ties to this case, 
other than political interests. That is Kevin Goff. He's the attorney for one of the three men charged with the murder of Ahmad Arbery who was running through a neighborhood in South Georgia in Glynn County. Uh, Satilla Shores was the neighborhood chased by three men in two pickup trucks. Those three men on trial for the murder. He represents one of them. He actually represents the man who didn't have a gun, but had a cell phone and recorded it, uh, the video of the shooting. Uh, there he is making an argument that there should be some sort of limit on the number of black pastors who can watch the trial inside the courtroom. And all that um, after Al Sharpton rolled into town and was inside the courtroom with the family. And uh, unbelievably, he mentioned Jesse Jackson, who at that point hadn't been there, but then showed up and was in court and uh, Kevin Goff again complaining about that. Uh, Ted Rollins, um, Kevin Goff has been on our air many times, so I can't say I am shocked by this, uh, but it is still shocking because courtrooms are open to whoever wants to come in and watch what's happening in a trial. Yeah, it is. Um an interesting argument. And from his perspective, he's sitting there and we had this, you know, a situation this week where the actually the other two defendant lawyers, uh, the defense teams um, joined him uh, in terms of a uh, motion for a mistrial because there was a, a situation where Wanda Cooper Jones, the mother of Ahmaud Arbery, had an emotional reaction to a photo of her son, which happens all the time. The jury turns to look over as they hear uh, the, the her whimper a bit, and she's sitting next to Jesse Jackson. Well, Kevin Goff then says, "Aha! See, I told you this. This is uh, this is very improper, and it's like a mob trial where you know you've got members of a mob in the gallery staring down jurors, um, you know, making the motion of putting the uh, you know cutting the throat." You, the, he, he articulated such an absurd argument that uh, jurors are going to look over and see, oh, Jesse Jackson, I better vote a certain way or I'll be in trouble. I don't know what to say other than um, what Judge Wamsley did uh, was, I think, perfect. He, he, he seemed to be just utterly shocked and disgusted by the fact that this kept coming up. Um, but Kevin Goff, actually filed a formal motion today and he, he wants to litigate this. He wants to at least keep track of who's in the courtroom for ap uh, appellate reasons. And take a listen. I mentioned that Jesse Jackson then did show up and here's what Kevin Goff said when Jesse Jackson did in fact show up. How many pastors does the Arbery family have? Um, we had the Reverend Al Sharpton here earlier uh, last week and I'm not keeping track, and I think the court has indicated the court doesn't intend to ask anyone to keep track of who was in the gallery. Um, but I don't know who Mr. Jackson, Reverend Jackson, is pastoring here. Um, my understanding is, and I, I was given names, that uh, the Arbery family have local pastors. They also have attorneys. Mr. Arbery, Marcus, has a team of lawyers to comfort him through these proceedings. Certainly, Ms. Cooper has been amply comforted by her legal counsel. Uh, and we are concerned about whether it's conscious or unconscious, the impact of their presence with respect to the jury and with respect to the proceedings in this case. And I guess the next question is, which pastor is next? Is Raphael Warnock going to make it be the next person appearing this afternoon? It'll be interesting to see if the senator shows up now that his name has been called out by Kevin Goff. I mean, it could happen. It could potentially happen. Um, it, Ted, now, obviously, the jury isn't hearing any of this. Um, but your thoughts about the point that he's trying to make, that jurors are going to be, to, to me, it's about the evidence. It's about the video. That's where your, your focus should be. His client is in a, I believe, a much different position than the two co-defendants since his client didn't have a gun, didn't initiate the chase and basically recorded it to provide the uh, best evidence for the prosecution in this case. I, I don't I don't understand quite where he's what his end game is, because uh, He's got to know that an appellate court's not going to look at this issue and say, oh, 
you didn't get a fair trial. Yeah. Well, here's the other part of the thing that, that Kevin Goff seems to be missing is that if indeed he lives in this community that is so, um, you know, ingrained and, and that doesn't like outsiders, well, then if, if his jurors are on that jury and, is, and if his mindset is in their minds, then they're going to look at Jesse Jackson and say, oh, gosh, Jesse Jackson's here and it'll work to his favor. The problem is he's living in a strange, paranoid world where he believes these outside forces are going to dictate the verdict in this case. And that's just simply not true. We've, you know, you and I have been in many high profile courtrooms where where the juror, the, the, the public's opinion is widely known by jurors and that there are protests outside the courthouse every day of the proceedings. Uh, it bleeds in, but it doesn't change the case. What's the difference between Wanda Cooper Jones sitting next to Jesse Jackson or Lacey Peterson's family sitting next to somebody in the courtroom that may be recognized from their victim family members. Of course, they're going to have support. Of course, they're going to be in a courtroom. And of course, they're going to influence a jury. It's just part of the equation. And for Kevin Goff to have this black white thing running through his mind 24 seven, it is uh, frankly embarrassing, I would say to members of the Glen County community that are watching all this take place. And, and, and I'll tell you this, not so much Reverend Jesse Jackson these days, but Al Sharpton is a very polarizing figure. And he, I, I think you hit the nail on the head there that some people will look at, some people look at Al Sharpton, you have one strong opinion and others will look at him and you have another strong opinion. And it, it could play either way. Uh, but at the end of the day, I don't think it's going to have any impact one way or the other, because this case for this jury is going to be about these videos and the um, and whether or not these defendants testify. That's what it's going to be about because it's again it's a it's a hybrid self defense case. There's other elements to it, but it, it comes down to uh, was this justified? What what these defendants were doing. And it doesn't have anything to do with Jesse Jackson or Al Sharpton. And when you've got a case with video evidence, statements made by the defendant, and the um, the strong possibility that one or more of them may take this the witness stand and testify, um, I think all of that extremely powerful and will guide this jury to whatever verdict they reach. And and guess what? His all of this is just backfiring because now more and more people are coming to the courtroom, more activity outside the courtroom. Um, he's just making matters worse. And Judge Wamsley pointed that out, um, that, that if you do think this is a problem, well, then you just made it uh, more of a problem. The bottom line, though, is, as you know, Vinny, jurors, if you don't respect the uh, the abilities of a juror, the, the in intellect of a juror, that it, there, guess what, Kevin Goff? These jurors are just as smart as you are, and you didn't, you wouldn't let this change your opinion. It's not going to change their opinion either. No juror is going to get up. Oh, I got to definitely vote one way because Jesse Jackson was there. They're going to listen to the evidence and make a decision. Yeah, and and looking at this case, and so much of it is predicated upon this uh, citizen's arrest, which is the alleged justification for the chase. And I think about that concept. It's a law that's now off the books in Georgia, but was on the books at the time. And, and I think uh, prosecutors, and, and we've got an indication uh, from what they've presented so far, they've got a very interesting argument when it comes to the citizen's arrest, which is that at the time all this was happening, none of them uttered the words citizen's arrest. And it sort of became... A, a legal justification, but not really their motivation for what they did that day. And, and to me, the actions of these guys um, is going to be difficult to justify because you don't really have evidence that there was this, this crime wave that was perceived in their minds. Like what was in their minds was not connected to reality, was not connected to the information that they were told. And they, and they sort of uh, took a leap and a jump with what was really happening in their neighborhood and what they were supposed to do in response to it. And I think that's going... I think it's going to be their biggest problem. You did have that one officer that came out after Larry English alerted um, police and the neighbors that uh, someone had tripped his cameras. You had the local cop who was sitting there with Travis and Greg, and they were hunting this guy down as this black boy, as they called him. It was a real um, 
you know, the, the body camera video that they showed was, was a real look into small town, Southern Georgia neighborhood. We have a problem. Um, citizens helping the police. Thank you so much guys for coming out and literally hunting for this guy. And this was uh, police sanctioned this initial look for Ahmaud Arbery. And that to me is that the opening of the mindset of the McMichaels, not Roddy Bryant, he's not part of any of this, but um, the McMichaels of, yeah, we were kind of, you know, we were making a citizen's arrest, but we were trying to help out. We're trying to do our best because, and, and they can look back to that, that interaction that night with the officer, um, which is disgusting on many levels from different perspectives, but it was a reality in there. And, and maybe, maybe jurors connect with that. And that, that again would put the jurors into, into their minds, right? Like what were they doing? Why were they doing it? What was their true motivation? Um, and I'm wondering um, how the jury approaches all of that. Do they approach it that as, as, as misguided or misinformed as they were about what was actually happening in their community? Does that somehow justify this chase? And then that gets you to the second part of the case, which is the actual moment of confrontation and whether or not it is, in fact, self-defense. Um, I, I think that part might actually be easier for the defense than the citizen's arrest part. The, I think the, the actual confrontation, you can look at it, and yes, they have guns, but it is Arbery who goes around the front of the truck towards Travis McMichael. I'm not saying it's a winning argument, but if I have to uh, judge the two pieces that the defense is attempting to establish, I think the second piece is easier for them to establish. I'm not saying it's easy, but easier than the first part. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it's another fascinating trial because it has so uh, much um, really at stake in uh, the, the public, I think, is weighed in overwhelmingly towards what they see in that video. Um, it'll be fascinating to see what jurors think and with the McMichaels, with with Travis McMichael compared to Greg McMichael. And, and then, but more importantly, uh, separating out Roddy Bryant, what's his level of culpability. And I think you're going to see all three on the witness stand trying to sway the jury. Yeah, that is going to be, uh, 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 I think, the whole case. I think the whole case, if they take the stand, that is the case. That is the case. That's the, I, And I think it's the only chance the defense has. Uh, but I don't know if that if their testimony will be convincing enough to raise that reasonable doubt. But we shall see. Ted Rollins busy in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Again, uh, as we are speaking, we're waiting for that jury to come back. At the time you're listening to this, the jury may already be back. Um, uh, but at this point, from our perspective, they aren't, and we don't know when that's going to happen. Ted Rollins, thanks so much. Thank you, Vinny. All right, when we come back, I'm going to give you my final word on everything that happened in, in Kenosha during these closing arguments and why they were so troubling to me, especially one moment when the prosecutor grabbed the gun. Follow Court TV live over the air, uninterrupted. If you're watching television with an antenna, just rescan your channels now to add Court TV. And go to CourtTV.com to see the exact channel position and more ways to watch Court TV in your area. So there was a moment during the closing argument in the case in Kenosha against Kyle Rittenhouse where the prosecutor, Thomas Binger, had the AR-15 in his hands and then raised the weapon. And from the camera angle, he's kind of pointing at it. He's pointing it over part of the gallery. It's And from the people I've spoken to who are inside the courtroom, he's pointing it at the wall, but he's raising the weapon and putting his finger on the trigger. And I, I, I it, to me, it was a problematic moment and for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, the way I would do it as a prosecutor, which is legitimately the way I am as a human being anyway, is I would treat that gun not so casually. And I would treat that gun um, as a very dangerous weapon and I would not point it or hold it up or do anything like that for demonstration purposes. If I wanted to do a demonstration, I, I would show that deference to the weapon and perhaps have 
um, a trained law enforcement professional do it and make sure that's very clear to the jury that that's what's happening. Um, but that didn't happen. And, and to me, if you're trying to prosecute someone for this use of this weapon, which you have described as so deadly and dangerous, why would you casually pick it up and point it inside a courtroom filled with people? To me, that's just bad. That's bad form. Let the defense do that. That's just bad, bad form. The only one who should have that, that, that weapon in their hands should be the defendant if you're the prosecutor. Try to get it in the defendant's hands when he's testifying, not, not you hold it up. To me, that's, that diminishes the, the, the theme of your entire case, which is that this weapon in the hands of this, of this man was such so outrageous, but then to kind of like point it around the courtroom. Now, something that they did, and I think this has been misplayed a little bit in, in social media and other places, is that the weapon was checked. There was a detective who was there who was checking the weapon both before um, the prosecutor putting it in his hands and the defense. And the judge was very clear and on the record because the defense attorney uh, took the weapon into his hands after lunch. And the judge asked the detective who was in charge of the weapon, whether or not the weapon had been cleared. And the, and the detective said, yes, it was cleared. And the judge said, before lunch or after lunch? And the detective said, before lunch. So then the judge said, check it again. Um, meaning, you know, it's now after lunch. We need to check it, clear it, make sure it's safe. And to me, that was a, a very important moment. And I thought a great moment by the judge. You know, we've been talking about on Court TV the case involving Alec Baldwin and what wasn't done in that case. And we, we see this situation in courtrooms all the time. And I think it was very significant and important uh, that the weapon was, in fact, cleared to be safe for anyone to touch it or pick it up. And that actually happened in the courtroom. Um, it has been talked about on social media that that wasn't done, but it was, I watched the trial. It was in fact done and the judge was on top of it and a huge lesson for everyone involved, you know, beginning with the public, the millions of people who were watching the trial. Number one, everyone in Hollywood, number two, who you, who use guns day in and day out. Uh, but to me, um, it was it was a, a good moment for the judge, but a bad moment for the prosecutor, um, not because the gun wasn't cleared and safe. It was. I saw that happen. But the fact that he put it in his hands so casually in front of the jury and you never want to do that. You almost want to don't even want to touch it because you want to convey that message to the jury that this is a dangerous weapon. And even though it's been in the hands of law enforcement, it's been cleared and it's been safe, it's still extremely dangerous and deadly. And when you pick it up like a toy gun and start pointing it around the courtroom, I think you're losing credibility um, with that jury in what you're trying to argue to them to convict uh, Kyle Rittenhouse. So bad, bad moment, I thought, for prosecutor. Great moment uh, for the judge. And the defense attorney picked it up. But what he did, which I thought was a good moment for him, was he never lifted the barrel. The barrel was pointed down the entire time he was handling it. And I think the other takeaway from all of that was that the defense attorney knows a thing or two about guns and gun safety and handled the gun appropriately in a room crowded with people. Whereas the prosecutor, it was clear to me, does not seem that comfortable or trained in gun safety and was pointing that weapon in the courtroom, which is full of people. You just don't do that. And putting his finger on the trigger, which you don't do. So if there are gun people, gun safety people in that jury, guess what, Mr. Prosecutor? You just lost more credibility in any arguments you have about that gun because you demonstrated that you know very little about gun safety in handling a weapon. You, you, it, it was, it was, the, the contrast was very apparent, and I think it's a, a missed opportunity and, and a bad moment uh, for the prosecution. But we'll see what the jury does. By the way, to see the verdict, you got to watch Court TV. We are available um, over the air. You can watch us with a, with a digital antenna 
If you have one of those digital antennas, please rescan it so you can find our signal. We've got links to all of the big moments in the trial in the, in the show notes you can go to. If you're listening to this after the verdict, uh, you can find the verdict, of course, at CourtTV.com as well. That's it for now. I am Vinny Politan. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back here again next week. Uh, stay safe. And as always, don't forget to hug the kids. This podcast is a production of Court TV. Go to CourtTV.com for more content, trials on demand, and to find out how to watch Court TV in your area.